I thank the Lord for giving me another opportunity to be able to visit with you. Thank you, Bishop, for allowing me to minister in the church today. I was here, I think, in the beginning of April, and I spoke. Who was here in the service? Anybody who was in the service? Uh, can you remember what I, is, I spoke about? Yeah, I spoke about uh, when John was asked, who would you say you are, and what would you like us to know about you? I don't know whether you have been able to answer that question because most of the things that will happen to you will depend on how you answer that question. I, I, I met someone who, who was in church when I immigrated to the United States. And the last sermon I preached at that time in April 1996, he was here and he, I met him recently and he told me he still remembers what I preached about. I preached about the words in John that unless a seed falls to the ground and is broken, it remains alone. But if it is falls down and is broken, it brings many, many more. And I'm happy to report that that word is true. The Lord has uh, multiplied me and helped me to be able to be a blessing to many people. I bring you greetings to, from the city of Memphis, from the International Community Christian Church. Do you receive them? I remember those words because he said, that friend I met, because the, there are many people in the church who said, then money doesn't matter, considering how much money he was earning. How can he leave all that money and go? Um, so, so I was amused uh, to hear that. But that is a word that the Lord gave me. And it, it's not the money or anything, but it's where the Lord is leading you to go. That's really what matters. It's not the amount of money that you earn or you have. Uh, let us find our text in the first book of Samuel, chapter 7. Uh, I want to speak to you how to be a winner indeed. To be a winner indeed. You can be called winner or victory, but you might not uh, live to that name. Let us read 1 Samuel chapter 7. So the men of Kiriath Jerium came and took up the ark of the Lord. They brought it to Abinadab's house on the hill and consecrated Lady Yeza his son to guard the ark of the Lord. The ark remained at Kiriath Jeriam a long time, 20 years in all. I'm reading from the New International Version. Then all the people of Israel turned to the Lord. Verse 3. So Samuel said to all the Israelites, If you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and Ashtaroth, and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their bowels and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted and they confessed. We have sinned against the Lord. Now Samuel was serving as leader of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. When the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of, of the Philistines. They say to Samuel, do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord uh, on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day the Lord thundered with a loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic 
that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out to Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below beth -Kar. Verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. How to be a winner indeed. The report that we have read here is a report of victory. Where a people have experienced a great victory. Where God, the enemy is coming to attack. And God has just sneezed, has thundered. Simba wa Yuda akaguruma. He just thundered. The enemies were put in a panic. They did not even need to raise their hands. And the enemy was defeated. Can you say they were winners? They actually won that battle. They won the battle. But this is the end of a movie. You are being shown the tail end of a movie. Because they are coming all the way from chapter 4. And already in this third battle, which the, the Lord has helped them to win, they have lost two battles. So they were losers. Now they are winners. So the question is, how do you turn a loser to a winner? How do you get you to be a winner indeed in the circumstances that you face in life? Different circumstances. You want to win. You want to be victorious. A winner is like prosperity. It is not all about money. Prosperity and winning is not all about money. Because there are many things, indeed there are many things that are more valuable, you cannot buy them with money. You cannot buy love with money. You can never buy joy with money. You can never buy peace with money. And these are the most expensive things. Indeed, when we try to entertain ourselves, we are trying to look for joy. It cannot be bought. So when we see winning and prosperity, we are not only talking money. But remember, money is also a part of winning. It's a part of prosperity. But it's not everything that it should be. A winner is not one who is Mr. Atlas. He's able to do everything by himself. To carry the earth on his shoulders. Mr. A winner is not a person who knows everything. But I want to suggest to you that a winner is the one who has a key to where he can get all the tools, to the storehouse, where you can get all the tools and the resources that you need. And that's what I want to maybe point to you to the key. So that you can have the key. Not that you are strong, but you know where to get the tools. Not that you know everything, but you, can, you know where to get what you need. The Bible says that the people returned to the Lord. When you look at chapter 4, uh, if we could have that on the screen, we can see where this movie starts. This, this victorious, this celebration in chapter 7, the beginning of this story is a very sad one. A real tragedy, as the literature people would call it. A tragedy. Because as you can see, the Israelites have gone out and engaged their enemy, the Philistines. And the Philistines, in the Bible, you can see them as a representation of all the evil forces that oppose God and the people of God. When you read about them, they, they, you can learn how God engages or how he helps his people to engage with challenges and enemies and everything that stands between them and the blessings of God. So the Philistines are a representation of that, the forces that oppose us. And Jesus says, the forces of evil stand on one side with the intent to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But the forces of God are on the other side coming to give you life and give it to you abundantly. So we see this battle that is in between, 
killing, destroying, and stealing, and giving life, and giving it abundantly. And we want to be winners. We want to be on the side that has life and life in abundance. We see in chapter 4 the first battle which they lost. They just, a war was declared and they went to war. And they were defeated by the Philistines. And when they were defeated, in verse 3, when the soldiers returned to the camp, the elders of Israel asked, that's in chapter 4, why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Why they asked this question is because they were a people of covenant. And God in the covenant had promised them that protection was a part of, of the covenant. So they wondered, how come we weren't expecting God to fight for us, but he didn't. And maybe you have always wondered, why did God not stop that? Why did God not do that? Why did God not provide that? And maybe you can learn from these people and see why you have an agreement, you have a contract, but the other party is refusing to perform. But the question is, have you performed your part? Because in law, if you don't perform your part, the other part is free not to perform. If you are the first person who is supposed to do, or if you fail to perform your part. But we know that with God, he stands with his covenant. And I see it as a person carrying an umbrella in the rain. The covenant, the relationship, he is covering you. But you get out of the umbrella. What is going to happen to you? You will be rained on. Has the covenant changed? No. It is you who has moved away from the covenant, from the umbrella. And that's why you are rained on. The question is, you need to check when you started being rained on. As the famous uh, Nigerian writer said, you have to check when the rain started beating you. And at that point, you, you know when you left the umbrella. And what do you do if you find you are being rained on and there is an umbrella? You return. And that's what we find in chapter 7. And Israel returned to the Lord. So in chapter 4, we see a people who are assuming things. They say, we are Christians. So let's go to a prayer meeting. And they see things don't happen. But they are already left the umbrella. They have left the covering. They have the Lord. Why do we know that? Because in chapter 7, the Bible tells us that they had already adopted the gods of the world, the Asherahs, the Baals, and everything else. As we continue in our Christian life, if we get mixed up with the world, to the disobedience of the word of God, then you will find that we pray. Then you will find that things are not working. We pray, we fast, we get prayed by the prophet, we get prayed by the apostle, and nothing happens. Because we are already broken the covenant. What was the covenant? That you will worship Jehovah God alone. If you have other gods in whatever form, if you have something that you have put beyond God or ahead of God, then that is an idol. And God says, I'm a jealous God. I'm not going to share my glory with anybody. I said it is a sad beginning of this story when they had gone out and were being rained on. In the first battle, they were defeated. So they blamed God. They said, why didn't you honor your part of the covenant and protect us? But I thought, instead of blaming, they should have checked themselves and asked, why maybe did he not honor? Could we maybe have done something? But no, they blamed God. Someone wise has said, whether you prevail or fail, it depends more on what you do to yourself than on what others do to you. So, looking for someone to blame, I may add, is time wasted. So, they were blaming God for their defeat instead of checking what might have caused their defeat. But now they said, okay, he did not honor their contract 
Now, we will take the contract with us, the agreement, to battle and wave it. Saying, you see, we have a covenant of protection. Protect us. So they actually took the ark of God, the symbol of the covenant, to war with them. So they were waving the agreement. As I told the first service, it's like you have a son. He's admitted at Puani University. You send him there. You rent a hostel for him. And then you start receiving reports that he's not attending classes and he has been seen drinking Munazi. And uh, also he's visiting some very odd places, Mwembe, something. Now, these reports have reached you. And now he, he's being thrown out by the owner of the hostel. Like, that's like the first battle. He's defeated. So he, he starts wondering, he looks at the birth certificate. Am I not son of so and so? How come I'm being thrown out? It's like these people looking, saying, why did God not protect us? Your father is in Nairobi. He paid everything. You went and wasted. And then you're asking, he looked at the birth certificate. Am I not son of so and so? That's what they were doing. Now, these people are not only claim, looking at the birth certificate. They have posted it on WhatsApp and even sent a copy to their, to their father to remind them of sonship. But we know, even in our, with our own children, that with disobedience, you deny, you, you decide, how much am I going to give this child? This child is disobedient. If I give him, he's going to drink Munazi. What do you do? You have a difficult time. Because you really don't want your son to be on the streets. And yes, you know most of the money you give him, you drink Munazi. This is the situation they are in. They have taken other gods, they have disobeyed God. They are out there, but they are showing the birth certificate. They are showing the document of the relationship. And that is the trouble that they are in. So what happens, they, they take the ark of God with them to battle. It's like this guy waving the birth certificate and claiming, I am son and son of so. But the birth certificate is not the relationship. It's just an indication. The ark of the covenant is not the covenant itself. The covenant is the relationship. It is the God of the ark, not the ark of God. It is not the Bible of God, it is the God of the Bible. We must cut through like this old lady. When the crowd had surrounded Jesus and she was in need of healing, she cut through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment. We must cut through the drama. The church is in this, the church today is in 1 Samuel chapter 4 to 7. A lot of drama. Drama. These people are playing drama. They carry the ark of God. A lot of things. You hear a lot of drama in the church. But all of it is empty. We need to cut through so that we can touch the hem of his garment. So that we can reach God, not his ark. So that we can cut through. When you have problems, you have to reach God. Even if you put the Bible under your pillow. You need to get the God of the Bible, not the Bible of God. It's not going to give you the peace. People play all kinds of tricks. You need to reach God. You need to relate to God directly. Jesus said, God is looking for people who will worship him in the spirit and truth. That's what it actually means. You are not looking for something to teach because God is spirit. Amen? Have you been buying some water with bottles? Anybody who has been buying water to, to sprinkle around your house or salt? <laughs> not, not the water here. Have you been buying some water in town to sprinkle around your house? God is a spirit. You might find he's not in the water in the bottle. Because he was not even in the ark. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth means you are not pretending. Truth means you are not hypocritical. Truth means you are not hiding things. Because even if you hide God, we'll see you see, isn't it? So they lost the first battle. 
because they were out of the umbrella they had lost the connection with the power source you know even if you have power in your house unless you connect with the plug you are going to the equipment is not going to work the covenant was there god was there it is them who were disconnected with him and that's why in chapter 7 when they reconnected it was like just, just, just like God waved his hand and the whole thing was, was done. You might have be looking for, maybe when I said I will give you the key, you are looking for a very soft, complicated key. I was speaking to Pastor Alice this morning and I told her it's only this week that I, I started using what they call a hotspot. I have two phones, one for Kenya and one for U.S., and any time I wanted to use my U.S. phone, I would wait until I go to a place where there is a Wi-Fi. All these years have been coming. And you would imagine that I'm ignorant about computers or about these things. But I'm not. But it's only this week my eyes were opened. And I said I've been carrying the Wi-Fi with me here. Because my local phone has bundles. And I've been carrying it all these years. And I could have been using it as a Wi-Fi for my other phone. Maybe you think I'm not very smart, eh? Maybe you're also thinking I'll give you a very sophisticated key. But I'm just telling you to replug. Replug with God. If you find things are not working, check your connection. Check your plug with God. Don't say I've been a Christian for five years. That's not, will not count. You're waving your birth certificate. And your father is not going to send you money just because you are waving the certificate. If you are, you, he has had reports that you are visiting Mwembe something and you are drinking Munazi or you are doing some other stuff, you might wave the birth certificate all day long and he's not going to send you anything. But as soon as you say, what am I doing? Like the prodigal son. And say, I will go back to my father. And this is not only for people who have not received Christ. Because these were the people of God, but they had gotten out of the umbrella of covenant. And they were being rained on. So they carried the ark of the Lord to battle. Thinking if I carry my birth certificate around my father and I send it in WhatsApp he will, and post it in Facebook, he will send me money. But you know, he did not send anything. They were defeated so bad in chapter 4. They lost thousands of men, 4,000 men. The two sons of the high priest Hophni and Phineas were killed. And to make it worse, the ark of the Lord was taken away. The birth certificate was taken away. The marriage certificate was taken away. We are waving it. It was a tragedy. Because when the man came from war to report back to the high priest what had happened, the old man who was over 90 years, when he, had, he heard that his two sons have died in war, and the ark of the Lord has been taken, the man just fell off the chair and broke his neck and died. It was a tragedy. Living outside the umbrella, these two sons of Eli, who were the ones who carried the ark of God to the war. The Bible writes in 2 Samuel that they were wicked men. They are even allowed wicked men to carry the ark of the Lord. They were disobedient. This is not the end of the tragedy. Because one of the sons had a wife who was pregnant. And when the report reached her, when she saw her father-in-law has died and broken his neck and passed off. When she heard her husband has died and she was a devout woman, the one that broke the camel's back, when she heard that the ark of the Lord had been taken, she just went into labor, premature labor. And when she was about to die in labor, she was asked, what are you going to name the child? She said, Archibald. Meaning, the glory of the Lord has departed. The key to being a winner 
is to move from a state of Archibald, a place where the presence of God is not present, to a place of Ebenezer, a place where you are receiving help, you are under the umbrella of God to receive help. Archibald, the glory of God, the presence of God has departed. You are, you are alone. You are uncovered. You are exposed. Because of what? What is the connecting word between Archibald and Ebenezer? It is obedience. Obedience. They went into disobedience and the glory of the Lord departed. They were exposed and they were defeated in war. And the high priest family died in one day. A tragedy. But we can turn tragedies into victories. When we say trust and obey. For there is no other way. But to trust and obey. We can turn our victories. That's why I said, oh you might be looking for a five point key. The key is to be in obedience to the word of God. That is how we remain under the covering. In chapter 7, the Bible says, then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. So we can see for sure that when they were being defeated in the two battles, they had actually gone away. Because we are being told they returned. And when they returned, it did not even take time for God to act on their behalf. And I want to tell you, you who has remained away from God, who has, you have been afraid, you think if you give your life to Christ, something God, bad is going to happen to you. I want to tell you, nothing bad is going to happen to you. In an instant, your life will turn from Archibald to Ebenezer, where you will experience the blessing of God. Where the word of God will cause your life to come alive. You become a winner from a loser. Good readers of the Bible would notice that in chapter 4, they actually camped in a place called Ebenezer, where they lost. So you can see, you can be called victory or winner and see you lose. It is only in chapter 7, verse 12, that the word Ebenezer comes alive. Before they were actually come, to, where they were defeated, they, were, they come to a place called Ebenezer, but it meant nothing. But when God is present, your name comes alive. So it's not what you call, you call yourself. It is whether God is there. Remember Samson, confronted by the enemies. He looked around. And what did he get? A jewel of a donkey. You'd think he's looking for a gun or a machete or a spear. What he got was a bone of a donkey. And he killed a thousand men of the enemy. How come? Oh, you think a, a jewel of a donkey is a great weapon? No, it is not the jewel of a bone. It is what was giving power. The source of the connection that gave power to the bone. Don't think that the stones that David took are the ones that killed Goliath. It is the power that was behind the stone. The presence of the Lord. He said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. So, it is not the ark of God. It is the God of the ark. You can carry the Bible all day long. But unless it comes alive in your life. All the promises. You will have the promises of God. But they're not the God of the promises. And the connection between Archibald and Ebenezer is obedience to the word of God. The Bible says obedience is greater than sacrifice. It doesn't matter what you do. If you are in disobedience, you find you are uncovered. You are uncovered. Because essentially, disobedience is actually walking away from the umbrella. You're actually refusing to hear what your father is. You're not going to school. You are in poor university. You've been admitted. He hears you in the street. It's disobedience. And until he hears the report that you have started attending classes and you have stopped taking Munazi and you have stopped going to Mwembe something, then he will not send money for the hostel. You will be defeated again. You will be on the streets. 
Because that's the relationship we have as a covenant people with God. We are God's children. And if we live in obedience, then you will find that your father, when you are in obedience, you are in Pan University and you are going to school as you should be. You will find he's doing things for you so that when you come during the holidays, you find already things lined up for you. Your father thinks ahead of you if you are an obedient child. And that is true of God as well. Read the scriptures. You will find that that is true. If you live in obedience, God will take care of your business even when you have not prayed. If you live in obedience. You can pray all day long in Karura Forest. But if you are living in disobedience, you find you are uncovered. Chapter 7. Then all the people of Israel sent back to the Lord. So Samuel said, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and Asherahs and commit yourself to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. Whatever your challenge is, look at your own life and see if there is anything that is of disobedience. Renounce it, reject it, and repent of it. And you will see that God will come and be able to help you in your situation. John said, who has warned you people of the wrath to come? If you have said you have repented, bear fruits of repentance. That's what Samuel is telling these people. If you say you have repented, return to God, then throw away the other gods. If you say you are changing, then you have to cut off those habits. You have to cut off those friends who are influencing you in a bad way. You have to cut off those relationships. You have to renounce them and repent of them so that you can come back to God and be under the covering of God. You might be looking for a more sophisticated key, but that's the key I hand to you. Repent and renounce anything that's not of God. Paul says, pulling down even ideas and thoughts that are against the knowledge of Christ. You pull them down. You, you renounce them. You repent of them. And you will find, you just say, in Jesus' name. You see, in the church we have a lot of drama. We have a lot of Ringo. You know what's Ringo? Ringo is when you have special language you speak. The church we have our own special Ringo. And in the Acts of the Apostles, there are some people who had listened to the church Ringo. They were called the sons of Skepha. These guys had heard that Paul would even send handkerchiefs and he would heal people. So the sons of Skepha had heard Paul say, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. So they, they went and confronted a man who had demons. And they said, in the name of Jesus. But the, the, the demons spoke and said, Paul we know and Jesus we know. Who are you? And there's a lot of Ringo in the church today. A lot of people praying all kinds of things. We have to cut through and see God. Do not be deceived by every wind of doctrine. If you are with God, as I told you last time, we know God has given apostles, pastors, bishops, all the leaders, and you have to respect them. But you need to take yourself to God. Don't go looking for a man of God you are the man of God you've been looking for. You are the woman of God you've been looking for. That's why many people are being scattered all over. Because they are looking for the next one. You are looking for a shortcut. Why can't you pray for yourself? Why do you want me to pray for you? Then if I pray for you, I charge you. Like, like people have been charged, they have been told, since I'm free and as a pastor, and you are busy at work, give me money and I'll be praying for you. Why do you do that? That's not scriptural. You need to pray for yourself. You can give in the church, but not so that you can be prayed for when you are busy at work. Amen? Have you heard of any friends doing that? Tell them today you had a preacher who said it's not good. Next time you meet your friends who are doing that, who are paying money because they are busy at work so that someone can be praying on their behalf, tell them it's not scriptural. God wants you to have a direct line with him. You are the man of God you've been looking for. You are the prophet you've been looking for. 
You are the apostle you've been looking for. Amen? Amen. Then, verse 5, chapter 7, Samuel said, Assemble Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day, they fasted, and they, there they confessed. We have sinned against the Lord. When the Philistines, chapter verse 7, when the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. When the Israel heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, do not stop crying to the Lord, our God, for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed. Sacrificed as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, verse 10, the Philistines drew near to engage in battle. But the Lord thundered. And my prayer today is the Lord will thunder in your situation. He thundered against the Philistines and threw them into panic because they wondered what has happened. These guys were coming to fight us and now we hear someone. It is like when Paul was going to persecute the Christians on the road to Damascus. A force greater than him throws him down on the floor. And he asks, who is that? He said, who is that, boss? Because anyone who throws you down, you have to call him boss. He said, who, who is that, boss? He said, it's Jesus, you've been persecuting me. The Lord will thunder. He was not persecuting Jesus, he was persecuting his people. God will speak and stand on your behalf. He will be the one to stand when your enemies attack you. They will find the thunder. They will hear a voice and they wonder, what are you saying? No, it's not me. Because God will fight your battles. God will fight our battles. He thundered against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic. They were routed before the Israelites. Verse 12, then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. They moved to a tragedy, to a place of celebration. A place of disobedience, to a place of victory by obedience, repentance, and renunciation of evil. And I want to tell you, don't look for a bigger key. Look at your life and look at the sockets, your connection to God. See whether they are well connected. See where the loose ends are. Because sometimes you connect, but the wires have a loose end. The electricians know that. And the power is not coming. What is that in your life that is blocking the power of God from working on your behalf? The Bible tells us that when Jesus was crucified, Peter followed from afar. You might still be following, but you are following from afar. And because he created a gap between him and the Lord, the enemy came and injected himself inside. He was following from afar. So he left a gap between him and God. We need our relationship with God to be tight. Real tight. Because the enemy wants to inject himself in the middle. That's how the enemy came and injected himself in the middle. If he had been standing with Jesus that time when he denied him, do you think he would have looked at Jesus and, and said, I don't know him, if they were standing together? Usually you don't deny someone who you are standing with. You'll be ashamed a little. But now when he's there, you say, I don't even know him. I don't even know him. He was following from afar. Maybe you've been following from afar, saying, I don't want to be too deep. I don't want to be too spiritual. Maybe you've been following from afar. You have reservations about the things of God. And the enemy will find that trick and will inject himself in the middle. And then you go some places, they say, oh, why, why don't we partake on, on this? Then you don't know what to say because you've been following from afar. The enemy has already injected you and tricked you. But if you are following the Lord and people already know you are saved, you save yourself from, 
from these people are, are tempting you. Those are simple keys. I don't bring with you any big key from America. Uh, it's a simple key, obedience. God is looking, is greater than sacrifice. That's what God says. So check your life and find if there are areas of disobedience to the Lord of God. Renounce and repent. Get your connections right. And then you will be surprised at how God will start working on your behalf. Amen? Let's pray. I have a Father, we thank you for your word which has spoken to us and reminded us that the battle is not ours but yours. But we are going to lose battles if we are not connected with you so that you who is a power source. We therefore pray, Lord, that you may help, help us to examine ourselves to find where the loose connections are, to find where we have disconnected from a power source, to find where we have moved away from the umbrella, the covering of God, and we are being rained on by all kinds of things. We pray that you may save us from drama, that you may help us to cut through the noise, to cut through the drama, to cut through the circus, to cut through all the physical impediments and realize that you are a spirit. And they that worship you must worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray for each family represented here, each individual, that Lord, your blessings which make rich and add no sorrow will be their portion today, that you may thunder in their situations, that you may say, peace be still, and the winds and the storms of life will be quieted. In Jesus' name, I pray for healing, many healings, healings of body, healings of mind, deliverance from every impediment, from every bondage, that by your spirit you may touch each person seated in this hall. And that this blessing will follow us as you extend it to our families. We stand as a representation of our families. Our parents who are far away, our relatives. We stand in your altar, Lord. Not only representing ourselves, but representing our loved ones. That God, the blessings you have sent us today, you may send it also abroad to them and bless them on our behalf. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We send healing to our relatives. We send healing to our friends and our families. In Jesus' name. Amen.